Good morning. I first saw Greg speak locally in an event. We're both from the New England area. Um, after he was diagnosed and published his book on Pluto, I was moved and inspired and made a mental plan to follow him on his journey. But as life goes, I eventually lost track in the day-to-day -day intensity of things. When I saw another opportunity to see him speak in this last year, I made sure to be there. Once again, I was inspired and in awe of his courage, honesty, and grit in the face of this disease. I approached him to buy the new edition of his book, a must read, by the way, and he will be doing some book signings later. And I mentioned our organization and the possibility of him speaking at our conference without much hope that that would materialize given his busy schedule. Greg's eyes lit up when I mentioned the location and he shared that he had family and friends in the area and a little bit of history. And so the conversations began. And here he is. And aren't we lucky? Greg O'Brien is an author of the international award-winning book on Pluto, Inside the Mind of Alzheimer's. And he has more than 35 years of newspaper and magazine experience as a writer, editor, investigative reporter, and publisher. He has contributed over the years, among other publications, to the Huffington Post, Psychology Today, USA Today, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Runner's World, The Arizona Republic, Boston Herald, Cape Cod Times, The Boston Irish Reporter, I love that, and The Boston Magazine. He's the author and editor of several books. O'Brien has published 17 books by other writers and was the founding managing director of Community Newspaper Company, established in Boston, now owned by Gateway Media. He lives in West Brewster on Cape Cod with his wife, Mary Catherine. The couple has three children, Brendan, Colleen, and Connor. O'Brien was diagnosed with, di diagnosed with uh, early onset Alzheimer's after a horrific head injury, unmasked, un uh, head injury unmasked a disease in the making, as doctors noted. His maternal grandfather and his mother died of the disease. O'Brien also carries a marker gene for Alzheimer's. Working off cognitive reserve and journalistic grit, he wrote on Pluno the first book written with an investigative reporter embedded inside the mind of Alzheimer's, chronicling the progression of his own disease. On Pluto has been translated into Mandarin and for distribution throughout China and translated for distribution throughout India and Italy, along with other foreign translations to come. Please join me and take away the outside distractions this morning. Put away your phones, your computers, and settle in, in this moment, with Mr. Greg O'Brien. Documentary filmmaker Steve James created this portrait of O'Brien for his Living with Alzheimer's, a film project to raise awareness about the disease. We'd like to share that video with you now. the same, in disarray. At first light, I must focus on the five W's before tossing the covers, the who, where, what, when, why, and how of life, as if rebooting my faithful MacBook Pro. On doctor's advice, I've begun labeling. I have attempted often to brush my teeth with liquid soap, and on two occasions gargle briefly with rubbing alcohol. There's only so many things I can do now, but the one thing I'm gonna do to the day I can't anymore is to be a reporter. And I'm writing a book, it's tentatively titled On Pluto, Inside the Mind of Alzheimer's. I'm doing maybe what my mother wished she could do, 
is to give people the blueprint of how to fight through this. It's my office, a, a, a place of memory for me. This office tells me about my life. First uh, copy of the Cape Cotter paper that I was editor and publisher. Here's my first big story, uh, basically about uh, how John Ehrlichman authorized the Ellsberg break-in. I, I see his um, possibilities of working much longer, <clears throat> dwindling every, every day. And um, the hardest thing for Daddy is he's always been very prideful of his intellect. I mean, it's always been about brains. So of all things for him to lose. Yeah. Um, I guess my two biggest concerns is, is, is the future and, and the finances. And Greg loves his house. And, that, uh, that, that's my, my biggest worry, losing a lifetime of memories and recollections and all that stuff because we couldn't stay here. Right. Um, What's harder for me is I feel like I've got to figure all this out. I've got to figure out the financial part. Um, I've got to figure out the logistics. I've got to figure out where we're going, what we're doing. As I told you know, the kids, I'm still living day to day, just getting through the week, getting through the week. I think I need somebody else to guide me through the next steps. I mean, he's lived a pretty kick-ass life. Yeah. yeah. He's the man. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if I get 60 years, I'm happy the with that. experiences that he's had. Yeah. These are um, pictures of the family. I am not recognizing people I've known all my life. I don't want to lose the memories of my life. I look at these photos and um, it brings me back and gives me purpose. And you gotta fight against losing focus. How he's choosing to deal with it, you know, that's gonna help us go forward. We're strong enough and close enough to just push on. At twilight, I'm back on the mat with the monster. That's why I run several miles each night to increase the cerebral flow as the sun sets and more confusion takes over. I run until my legs give out. I'm in this race against this demon called Alzheimer's and I see it gaining on me. And when it gains on me, I try to run faster and I'm gonna keep running faster, but I know the denouement of it from my grandfather and my mother is a time that it's gonna overtake me. There's only so long you can fight. When he has to be on point, you know, he'll save up all of his energy and he'll do really good, but then he just has to shut down. place called Pluto, there's no pressure anymore. And I don't want to sound like, um, I'm trying to think of the word, a guy who gives up because I'm not. But sometimes you have to give in. Uh, it scares you a little bit because he's the one that runs his family. He, he's, he's done everything for all of us, and um, it's pretty sad to see sometimes. It just sucks knowing that the guy, the guy that I knew when I was growing up, my one of my best friends. Right. Let's, um, so, let's say a prayer. I look, yeah. lost him forever. We thank you, Lord, for um, everything that you've given us.
But the worst part is I'm still going to have to see him and know that he's gone. That's why the disease f sucks. Brendan is my strength. He's the oldest boy in an Irish family. I want him to take charge. You help me with this? Yeah. Can't figure it out. Hey, you want me no, to no, do no, help? No, no. Can you do this one? Yeah. yeah thanks. Yeah. So I guess the tables have kind of turned. I am basically becoming his guardian. We, we connect on a totally different level when we're on the boat. We don't often get super deep conversations. We don't need to talk, get intellectual or anything like that. We just sort of just enjoy the moment. Well, it's so peaceful out here. I've always been drawn to the water. It's again, another place where I go now and it feels like me that I haven't lost me. Well, as long as we're around, they'll be coming out. Yeah, bring me out in a box. <laughs> we'll drag you out here. Yeah. You may not know where you are, but we'll have you out here. <laughs> there you go. Let it rip. He loves just opening up the you know, throttle on the, on the engine and just fire in the way. I think he just, it's the kid inside of him. That 16 year old is still there. There are days when I think someday I might go out on that boat and choose not to come back. But then I can't help but look at my son and say, I have to come home. It's good to be out. First of all, I, I um, want to acknowledge my wife, Mary Catherine, and my son, Connor, who's over there, and also my, uh, my brother-in-law, Lou, and I'm going to have some fun with him because he was just here for the free coffee. <laughs> Lou and I uh, roomed together at the University of Arizona with his other bro brother, Tommy, and they used to give me all sorts of crap coming from the East Coast, and so I thought I could really screw them up by marrying their sister. <laughs> so she's pretty, so it was very, it was, worked out good for me. Um, in, in my journey, Connor, my son Connor is my guidepost who travels with me and picking up the mess after I often lose it, he should be a saint. Um, and Mary Catherine is, is my, my, my love post uh, as with Connor, she puts up with a lot. You know, often you strike out in moments of desperation at the ones you love, family and God, and I'm guilty of both. I love you, Mary Catherine, and I love you, Connor. Thank you for putting up with me. You know, there was a time that I could um, speak a thousand to a thousand people without notes, and um, not now, not on this journey, not even close. So I have to read from this, and, and I hope that's okay with you. Um, I've written it for you, and uh, 
there was a time in writing something like this, it might have taken me 45 minutes. This took me close to two weeks. Um, the, uh, the writing process for me is, uh, is intense. It takes uh, every bit of fuel within me, steam coming out of the ears, but, but this, is, this is from the heart. Can, can everyone hear me, by the way? Okay. Um, you know, Alzheimer's has been around a long time, perhaps maybe even back, dating back to the Garden of Eden. What was Adam thinking? <laughs> I'm going to get you to laugh a couple of times, so it, it's okay. And, and by the way, I have a childhood friend over there, he's saying no, 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 but I'm going to just tell him. Steve Eccleson, he's a uh, well-known Hollywood producer, and we went to grammar school together, and his mother um, and my mother were friends, and his mother and my mother both died of Alzheimer's. God bless you, Steve. Um, you know, about 2,400 years ago, Plato described an illness, quote, um, it, it, it said it gives rise to all manners of for forgetfulness as well as stupidity, and he was referring to Alzheimer's and, and dementia. And about 2,000 years ago, the Roman poet Juvenal characterized the phenomenon, quote, worse than any loss in the body, is failing of the mind, which forgets names and cannot recognize the face of an old friend who dined with him last night, nor those of the children whom he has begotten and brought up. In ancient Egypt, a scribe wrote of a close associate, quote, every night becomes more and more childish. But scripture, perhaps unwittingly, put an exclamation point on Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia in the Gospel of John. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and walked wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and carry you to places you do not want to go. John 21, 18. I want to talk to you today about the holy and accurate stereotype of Alzheimer's. I want to talk to you today about the fight 24-7 to stay in the moment. I want to talk to you today about living in faith and humor while researchers and medical professions race for a cure. And I want to talk to you today about hope when at times there is no semblance of it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today and for your generous support in finding a cure for this demon of a disease. Without your passion, leadership, and commitment, Alzheimer's research would be light years away from it is today. I couldn't stand here today without your collective efforts, so thank you. We still have a long way to go. To fight an enemy, one must study the enemy and have working strategies in place. As the author of The Art of War, the great ancient Chinese general Sun Tzu once counseled, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. As an investigative reporter, now struggling with this disease, one that has decimated my family tree, I have studied this enemy. It is a cunning, calculating killer. Alzheimer's is not your grandfather's disease. It's a disease, the experts say, that can take 20 to 25 years to run its serpentine course. And the experts say the pathology in the brain can begin when one is in their 40s without noticeable symptoms. So putting the stereotypes aside, there are no two patterns of Alzheimer's that are alike, and that confounds the researchers and exacerbates the race for a cure. In short, one doesn't get Alzheimer's the day one is diagnosed, just as one doesn't develop cancer at the moment of a diagnosis. It's a journey in process. A son or daughter who says their mother or father died of Alzheimer's five or six years after a diagnosis likely means that that mother or father suffered silently from progressing symptoms of Alzheimer's for as long as two decades. On Pluto, inside the mind of Alzheimer's is about the silent struggle, about bringing the disease out of the closet. We need to start talking about Alzheimer's, bluntly and accurately, just as we did about cancer after many years ago calling it the big C, and then the horrifying AIDS epidemic that was treated by some as modern-day leprosy. When you will blow away stereotypes, the public then can begin to care more, as they did about cancer and AIDS, uh, than hiding from it. And we need that cancer today with Alzheimer's. There's an old newspaper axiom. If someone doesn't tell their own story, someone will tell it for them and not accurately. 
folks we need collectively to tell our story. It's the elephant in the room, yet this elephant forgets. Some alarming statistics that I'm sure many of you know, an estimated 5.7 million Americans have Alzheimer's, 44 million worldwide, yet only one in four, the experts say, get diagnosed. This is a disease that's expected to double and triple. And that add in all the people who are fearful of getting a diagnosis because we can't talk about this disease. And you're probably looking at maybe the biggest killer in the world. Tick, tick, tick. Every 65 seconds, someone in the United States develop Alzheimer's. By 2050, that will occur every 33 seconds, experts say, and three, every three seconds worldwide. Alzheimer's can also be sexist. Two-thirds of its victims and, and caregivers are women. In addition, it can be racist. African Americans are two to three times as likely, and Latinos are 1.5 times more likely to develop Alzheimer's than white Americans, white Irish guys like me. But no one is safe. A death is a death. Alzheimer's respects no demographic, no gender, race, religion. If there ever was a bipartisan issue to stand on, it's for a swifter, earlier diagnosis for a cure. Do I have your attention? This is a story, folks, that could be yours someday, or the story of a loved one. Please don't think it couldn't. I know the front line well. Alzheimer's stole my maternal grandfather and my mother. A few years ago, my paternal uncle died of the disease, and before my father's death, he too was diagnosed with dementia. Now Alzheimer's has come for me. I was diagnosed several years ago with early onset Alzheimer's after the horrific symptoms of short-term memory loss, inability to recognize individuals and places I've known all my life, difficulty completing simple tasks, terrible judgment, incontinence, confusion with time, place, hallucinations, and withdrawals. After a battery of tests, as Kate said, and brain scans and spec scans confirmed the diagnosis, which doctor said was moved along by two serious head traumas that I wasn't supposed to survive. I also carry the marker gene APOE4 that appears to be on both sides of the family. The diagnosis came two weeks after I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, which in consult with my doctors and family, I'm not treating. It is my exit strategy. Otherwise, things are just pisser, as they say in Boston. <laughs> you can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> you know, Stephen King, couldn't have designed a better plot for sickness that slowly steals the mind, then pilfers the body, then robs your finances, pushing families like mine to bankruptcy. And then there's a depression that seems to have no bottom. Yet Alzheimer's can't take your soul. So please don't be fooled by the stereotypes, as I've said before. There are millions of individuals living with Alzheimer's in early stages, still highly functioning, perhaps not even diagnosed yet, who are fighting off horrific symptoms daily beyond the observations of others. Collectively, our minds in many ways are like iPhones, still sophisticated devices, but has a short-term battery, pocket dials, and gets lost very easily. Mine about 40 times a day, and Connor hears all the F-bombs to try to calm me down. Um, this is sometimes what happens, you, you lose your track, so I just lost it, but that's why I have the speech, so everything. Nobody panic. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I'll never forget sitting in the neurologist's office outside Boston, side by side with my wife, Mary Catherine, of, is it 43 years? <laughs> yes. About bliss or kind of? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, mister. Um, <laughs> Listening to the diagnosis, I felt as though I was slipping into Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, where nothing would be what it is because everything would be what it isn't. What would be was devastating for me. I felt the tears running down the sides of my face. My eyes didn't blink, blink, excuse me. Sometimes it's hard to talk about. <clears throat> I reached for my wife's hand and asked, what about the kids? You know, Alzheimer's is about the kids. Your kids, my kids, your grandchildren, my grandchildren. So where am I today? 
60% of my short-term memory at times can be gone in 30 seconds. More and more, I don't recognize people I've known all my life. I fly into an execrable rage when the light in the brain uh, goes out. I have a debilitating loss of filter, loss of self-judgment with time and place. And then at times, there's the numbing of the mind and body. I have no feeling right now in both legs from my feet to my knees uh, because, among other reasons, brain signals are not connecting properly. This disease breaks your body down as well as the mind. Um, the mind is the control panel for the body. Also recently, I've been uh, diagnosed with acute spinal stenosis and scoliosis. Um, again, a condition that's moved along by a breakdown of the body. And also diagnosed recently with macular degeneration and glaucoma, slowly losing my sight. My doctors say the eyes are a window to the brain. A study last year found a significant link between Alzheimer's and three degenerative eye diseases, macular degeneration and glaucoma among them. Then there's the depression, the black hole that has no bottom, often pushing one to a bo booster rocket to Pluto. Like cancer and AIDS and Alzheimer's today, depression is taboo. It's too messy. We can't talk about it. Yet depression is as common in Alzheimer's as forgetting a name. Alzheimer's is not just memory loss, it's a slow and complete breakdown. And then there are the spiders. There's sometimes, at all times a day, I see platoons of them floating along the wall, and they float down in, in, in right angles right at me. And my mother told me a long time ago who experienced the hallucinations. She said, they're not real. Just brush them away. She taught me, uh, told me uh, years ago it's an apocryphal story about uh, Martin Luther, not the great Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther, uh, who was the, the evangelist, and he was taunted, as, as the uh, apocryphal story goes, by Satan. And my mother told me in this story that one night he woke up from bed and he saw Satan sitting at the end of his bed, and he looked at him and he says, oh, it's just you, and went back to sleep. And my mother taught me to say, oh, it's just you. Al. I call Al Mr. Fucker, too, but I hope that's. <laughs> I, Pam, how many F-bombs did you tell me? I, my wife is going like this. So. And Steve is saying, oh, geez. Um, you know, battling Alzheimer's uh, is, is, is in some ways like being lost in a basement. So I know I'm in Arizona, but I'm sure some of you people have lived in a home with a basement. So let me ask, how many people have ever lived in a home with a basement? Raise your hand. Wow, you guys are from around the country. <laughs> how many people have ever done their laundry in the basement? Raise your hand. I, I, I gave a speech once, and um, there's a guy who raised his hand, and his wife turned to him and said, you never do the laundry. <laughs> so. There are a lot of women here, so I think that's okay. <laughs> How many people have ever been in a basement at night doing their laundry when someone up in the kitchen didn't realize you were there and shut off the light? <laughs> Penetrating darkness, I don't know about you, but that's when I toss the F-bombs, uh, when, when, when the light in my brain goes out. Um, the light goes out, it goes on, it's off again, it's on again in the early stages, like me. And, it flickers as the synapse in the brain fails. Um, and the denouement is that one day, the light will go off and there'll be no one up in the kitchen to turn it back on. So what can you do? Plenty, two words to remember, brain health. People freely talk with their doctors about heart health. Women line up to get mammograms uh, and, and women and men uh, get, get screenings for other cancers. No one wants to talk about brain health. It's too messy. We need to change that. You can build your cognitive reserve and, and what doctors call, and I had to look this up, neuroplasticity at every age. Cognitive reserve, the scientists will tell you, enables one to engage another gear in the brain and suddenly accelerate to avoid an obstacle. Neuroplasticity, the science tell you, quote, is the brain's ability to reorganize itself by forming new connections throughout life. 
you know, to play off the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz, if I only had a brain. Well, you do, and we need to use it more. I serve on the board of Us Against Alzheimer's, a distinguished advocacy and research organization founded in 2010, headquartered in Washington, D.C., and it's pushed hard for expanding treatments and ending the disease. I also serve as a patient advocate for the Cure Alzheimer's Fund of Boston and have served on the National Alzheimer's Association Early Onset Advisory Group out of Chicago. I should tell you, though, that all I did in high school was cut up a frog and my friends at Us Against Alzheimer's have prepared three slides that are far above my pay grade, but hopefully they will resonate with you. So if someone's smarter than me, not necessarily the guy who hit the film button, uh, just, <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that. He's a great guy, I've never met him. If someone smarter than me could hit the first slide, slide one, do you believe in miracles? Uh, fact, at all ages, there are things one can do and should do to optimize your brain health and reduce risk for cognitive decline. For example, high cholesterol levels and high blood pressure may raise your risk. Slide two. Fact, research has estimated that one third of Alzheimer's cases can be prevented by lifestyle and risk reduction strategies that can be taken. You should exercise, diet, sleep, reduce stress, brain fitness, and community connections. Slide three, fact. There are more than 263 studies on dementia, causation, and prevention. We are learning more and more every day about what can do to slow the train down, and possibly one day with greater resources and, and with the grace of God, prevent it. But that's not today. That's the prayer for the future. My mother, the hero of my life, taught me by her courageous example uh, to fight Alzheimer's. And when the brain fall, fails to write and speak from the heart, which I believe is the place of the soul that survives forever. So my mom taught me to speak and write from the heart as she could. And she could, at her at similar stage I am, she could have stood here and talked to you. She was a, a beautiful, very smart, articulate woman. Has anyone ever asked you, tell me what's on your heart? Speak from your heart. A poet writes from the heart, not the brain. And in Alzheimer's, we all strive as we can to speak from the heart. You know, years ago, I thought I was Clark Kent, Superman, an award-winning journalist who feared nothing. But today, I feel more like a baffled Jimmy Olsen, and on days of muddle, more like Mr. Magoo, the wispy cartoon character who couldn't see straight, exacerbated by stubbornness to acknowledge a problem, or like Mr. Potato Head with the wacky pushpins and all, or like a codfish landed on the dock, a fish rots from the head down. Reinforcing the critical need for early diagnosis and life strategies, doctors tell me I'm working off that cognitive reserve. They tell me um, to slow down, conserve the tank, as they told my mother. It's lights out, they warn, when the tank goes dry. In layman's terms, the right side of my brain, the creative sweet spot, is intact for the most part, although the writing and communication process, as I told you, takes incredibly longer. The left side of the brain reserved for executive functions, judgment, balance, continence, short-term memory, financial analysis, recognition of family and friends, is at times in a free fall. Doctors advise that I will likely communicate and write with declining articulation until the lights go dim, but other functions will continue to ebb. So daily exercise and writing are my sucre to reboot and reduce confusion. I try to stay locked in as a missile is on target, but locked in likewise is a medical term in which an individual who cannot speak because of paralysis communicates through the blink of an eye. Some days I find myself between definitions using every available memory device and strategy, cerebral and handheld, to communicate. Daily medications, the legal limits, serve to slow down the progression of the disease and help to control the rage on days when I hurl a phone across the room with perfect strike to the sink because in the moment I don't remember how to dial or when I smash the lawn sprinkler against an oak tree in the backyard because I don't recall how it works 
or when I push open the flaming hot glass door to the family room wood still barehanded to stroke the fire, just because I thought it was a good idea until the skin melts in a second degree burn. Or simply, when I cry privately the tears of a little boy because I fear that I'm alone, nobody cares, and the innings are starting to fade. Alzheimer's indeed is a sickness that runs in circles and eventually meanders for a kill. It's analogous to the prototypical arcade game Pac-Man in which a pie-faced yellow icon navigates a maze of challenges, eating pack dots to get to the next level. While the iconic video game was designed to have no ending, there were no power, pe pe excuse me, there were no power pellets in Alzheimer's to consume the enemies of ghosts, goblins, and monsters as my Pac-Man in slow motion consumes brain cells one by one. Game over. Not always if one is willing to fight with gut instincts and with the help of individuals like you. You know, we can learn legions from the words of others. Iconic poet Robert Fra Frost once observed, in three words, I can sum up everything I've learned about life. Quote, it goes on. Woody Allen, in a wry exchange in the movie Annie Hall, put an exclamation point on several instincts in an anecdote about a guy who goes to a psychiatrist complaining about his brother who thinks he's a chicken. When the doctor suggests he turns his brother in, the man replies, I would but I need the eggs. <laughs> you, you, you're gonna make me feel better if you laugh. <laughs> My family needs the eggs. You know, the Irish like to say, never get mad, get even. And so I'm getting even with Alzheimer's. Not for me, the train has left, but for my children, for you, for your children, and for a generation of baby boomers and their families and loved ones who face this demon prowling like Abaddon. The only way to face this demon is head on through faith, hope, and humor, as it robs everything that you have and, 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 and then it takes your body functions, kind of the yin and yang of Alzheimer's. More and more, I'm withdrawing from family and close friends and social situations. Uh, in my Irish way, in my earlier years, I was the guy who lit up the room, the senator from Cape Cod, my friends called me. You know, I'm okay reading this prepared speech, though it took two weeks to write, but if I had to meet in a small group and exchange a conversation, it will be difficult for me, highly challenging as the brain cannot process noise in this disease or where it's coming from, a high state of confusion as the quietest sounds uh, accelerate in the mind. It's akin to the movie Psycho, the screeching noise before someone gets stabbed. You know, er, er. Uh, that one wasn't so good. <laughs> Sorry. What's wrong with this picture? Well, the reverse side is loss of filter, which to a great extent, I'm enjoying more and more. <laughs> I've, I've, bec I've, become more uh, I've become more Larry David-like. He is a personal hero of mine. A bucket list of mine is to meet him someday. He says what everyone else wants to say, but is inhibited. Not me, not anymore. God bless you, Larry David. Humor goes a long way in fighting the disease. You have to laugh at an enemy or the enemy owns you and greatly intimidates. In Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, one becomes in, uh, inhibited, by in, inhibited by malfunctions in the brain. The experts will tell you, quote, the frontal cortex is the region of the brain that acts like a filter. And when that's broken, you have no filter. Airports are a place of great confusion for me. Um, it's just too much noise. And, uh, and, and the other thing too, uh, I'm gonna tell you about a trip I took to Los Angeles with my wife to speak. And um, I was very upset going into the airport, so much noise and, and just coming from in confusion, coming from all different directions. And, and then, you know, I'm an Irish guy, so it's not politically correct to say this, but I, I always wanted to be the guy, you know, the guy who fixes things, the guy and I can't be the guy anymore. My wife has to be the guy. I lovingly call her the warden, but it's a, it's a love name. <laughs> so um, you go to the airport today and they took a, for airports, a word out of the dictionary. It's called customer service. It, it does not exist anymore. And they have these things that look like R2-D2 and, and you gotta poke shit at it. And I'm sorry, shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> 
and it's very confusing. So uh, my wife, who's the guy now, was, was poking at R2-D2, and the only thing I could think to say, because I had to say something to feel I was in control, is I said to her, in my, you're supposed to have your quiet voice in the airport, and I have a loud voice now. So I said to her, it's not working. <laughs> she said, what? I said, it's not working. She turned at me, and you know those looks with a spouse or, or, or you know, a, a, a close friend where, where they could burn your retinas? And um, <laughs> she said, yes, it is. And I said, no, it isn't. It's not working. Now, I was starting to draw a crowd. <laughs> All the passengers are putting their, um, um, these things. All right, whoever got it. Okay, you don't have Alzheimer's. Um, and they were listening. And all of a sudden, I drew the attention of um, the TSA. And um, this woman, I'm sure she's very nice, but she was big. I think she used to play linebacker for the Giants. And um, she came over and said, what's wrong, sir? And I looked at her and I said, it's not working. And she said, yes, it is. And I said, no, it isn't. So then she pushed me out of the way and um, went um, to R2-D2 and gently push my wife aside, starts poking, and all of a sudden R2-D2 starts spitting all this stuff out. And in Alzheimer's, which I'll tell you in another anecdote in a little bit, your DEF CON increases when you're confused. So I'm getting up there now. And so she, she hands me this thing, and it's this long strip thing, and she said, here. And I said, what the hell am I supposed to do with that? And then she talked to me like the two-year-old that I was, and she said, you put them on your back. And then I said, without thinking, in my loud voice, well, am I supposed to fly the fucking plane too? <laughs> You're not supposed to say that. You're not supposed to say that. So um, uh, now the the the... the Everyone's descending on me. My wife had to say, look, my husband's nuts. And, and, and she told him about it. And she, he said, okay, let's, um, let's get him out of here. Um, another, what I'm trying to do now is to give you a couple examples. If I can't get you to laugh, then you're going to be intimidated by this enemy. And uh, not long ago, I was in Manhattan for a speech and in an inter interview with my son, Connor, Connor. And we're in a cab heading down Broadway to Lower Manhattan Hotel. The route was confusing to me. Too many bright lights, too much noise, too many people. My mind went into overdrive, the telltale paranoia of Alzheimer's. I envisioned that we were being kidnapped only to be drowned in the Hudson River with cinder blocks for ballast. The cab driver didn't speak English. That upset me, and looking back, I apologize for that. I was wrong, and I'm not proud of my behavior. And so I yelled at the cab driver several times, and he wasn't listening. He just, I just yelled louder and louder, and Connor tried to unsuccessfully calm me, but no dice. At the next red light... Well, you see the word bullshit? Oh, okay. <laughs> that's, that's the cab driver. That, that, that's, the cab, that's the cab driver. But anyway, so I got out of the cab. I, I got out of the cab, and I started walking down the street. And, and Connor took a cab to, to the hotel. And um, I was so angry, I was hoping that um, I'd get mugged so I could, I could get into a fight with someone. But I, I, came, I came across uh, uh, two police officers who, who kind of led me along the way, and, and, and finally, finally I got there. You know, another case in point, which I wrote about recently in Psychology Today about loss of judgment, um, was, a, a, in, in, and I'll read an excerpt from it, that my wife, Mary Catherine, um, was, is a dedicated special needs uh, assistant at Nauset Regional School District, and she left for a well-deserved uh, spring break to come to Phoenix last, uh, last spring. And Connor was left behind to guide the family tiller. But on Cape Cod, there are dangerous currents, riptides, and sharks, not only on the beach, but inside the mind of Alzheimer's. Um, during that time, I was kind of relegated to the couch. I wasn't feeling well. Um, but the sharks were thrashing as Mary Catherine's Boeing 737 lifted off the tarmac at Boston Airport and banked a left for Phoenix. It was the start of a week that was uneventful. 
other than continued breakdown of the body, the brain is also, as I said, the control panel. I was down a few courts with the immune system deficiencies and relegated to the confines of the couch. How much news can someone watch these days without poking your eyes out? I had a speech that Wednesday outside Boston and son Connor, my sergeant at arms, drove me and repairs to the Sagamore Bridge that connects to Cape Cod and the mainland added two s stressful hours to the trip and we didn't get home till late. And following day, I was spoke to, uh, supposed to speak in Wellesley just outside Boston before a Sisters of Charity event that attracted a broad audience. I had spoken there before and having been taught by the nuns in grammar school, I wanted to be on time in good order. I've always loved nuns, they're pretty cool and caring. But first I had to head to Nantucket for meetings. Like others in this disease, I still have to make a living to avoid bankruptcy as long as we can. Um, so I, I decided, and I'm not supposed to drive, I decided to make a command decision, because the warden was gone, that I would drive um, to, to get the ferry. And then I was gonna call my son and tell him he could pick me up and then we'll, we'll go to, to Wellesley. So I, when Connor heard I took the car, he was angry as he should have been, and, and I said, look, we're just gonna, you could pick me up when the ferry comes back and we're gonna go. And along the way, I found that the uh, backup at the bridge was now three hours and we would never, we'd never make the speech. So. In, 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 a, in my own bad judgment, uh, and in the moment, I decide to drive to Wellesley myself. Okay. And I call Connor, and he was upset as he should have been, and, and maneuvering through bridge traffic was, was a maze of chaos. I prayed half the time and took the Lord's name in vain the other half. <laughs> Using a hands-free phone, I called the nuns to tell them I'd be about a half hour to 40 minutes late. Using the collective we, they kept calling periodically to ensure I was on schedule. The audience was assembling and one of the nuns began reading from on Pluto to appease the crowd, a mix of nuns, caregivers, those with Alzheimer's and other interest, interested parties. As I got close, I realized I didn't have the exit number off the highway. So I called. Sister, I asked, what's the exit number? She didn't know the precise number and then said, are you okay? I gave the exit number to Connor, just ask him. There was a pause. Uh, Connor is uh, not in the car, I said. There was another pause at her end. She cupped the phone and turned to a nun standing next to her and said, oh shit, he's alone. <laughs> Nuns are cool. I explained the situation that I was okay but required the entry code. Quote, I need you to be one of those guys at the airport with the large flashlight devices that guide planes into the gate. The sisters agreed, they stayed on the phone for more than 15 minutes and brought me safely into a landing. They positioned associates at the entrance of the facility waving at me so I didn't miss the turn. <laughs> I felt like Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. <laughs> I had my speech, read it carefully, the event and got a standing ovation and book signing and I was ready to go but I was fearing the ride home, it was late now. Uh, I could have stopped overnight at any of my friends' homes along the way, but worried that they might wrap me out to the warden. Again, the judgment thing. Not so fast when the nun said, calling upon the audience to pray for me with hands outstretched almost like a Billy Graham moment. So I said, wow, after, after the prayer, I said, okay, this must be a sign of God that it's okay to drive home. <laughs> but after the prayer, two imposing nuns about the size of pro linebackers approached me Gregory, they said, invoking my proper name as my mother did when she was angry at me, not so fast, you're not driving. <laughs> Upon learning of my bad judgment, the nuns had conference in what seemed like the urgency of a Vatican Council. I was told that one of the nuns would drive my car back to the Cape with me strapped to the passenger seat. And another nun would follow, God bless him. We want to do this, they said, and besides, if something happened to you along the way, the world would say our prayers don't work. <laughs> so the verdict was delivered. Oh, and one more thing, Gregory. We called your house and left a voice message for your wife about all this. <laughs> oh, shit, I thought. Obviously, I had to delete the message when I got home, but in Alzheimer's, simple tasks like receiving and deleting voice messages are not simple. I had forgotten how to do it. So the next day, I text the warden in Phoenix. 
it's kind of a venial sin. It's nice about being Catholic because you could do venial sins, not mortal sins. So, so my text was, I'm getting some work-related messages on the house phone. Uh, it's kind of work-related. <laughs> Can you tell me how to access and delete so there's room for your messages? <laughs> Just saying. I got a text back from Mary Catherine with the code. Then I listened to the voicemail in horror. Mrs. O'Brien, I want to let you know that your husband drove here alone. He shouldn't have done that. It's poor judgment. We care about him. He drove, and, and, and we drove him home safely. We wanted you to know this. Click. I, uh, I, hit, I hit the button again. I hit the button again. And, um, you know, it was, it, it was funny. I, I w was able to not tell my wife about it until she read the piece in Psychology Today. No, she didn't read. No, a friend said, you need to, do you know what your knucklehead husband did? So anyway, um, what I'm, again, what I'm trying to do is to show you a couple things, how you fight this disease in faith, hope, and humor, because right now there is no cure, and that's why we need people like you. Um, you know, I want to close with a brief excerpt from an essay my wife Mary Catherine wrote in On Pluto uh, about the pluck of caregivers, writes Mary Catherine in a chapter name called Miles from Nowhere, a reference to Cat Stevens, the tea and the Tillerman. Quote, years ago, life got worse as Greg's mother in East Ham drifted deeper into Alzheimer's and his father began the journey and we became family caregivers. I saw firsthand the terrifying, disconnected, debilitating, hostile nature of this disease. Then to my horror, I began to see it in my husband. Invasion of the body snatchers, as Greg calls Alzheimer's. Slow at first, then a quickening pace. The explosions, the rage, the drifting, the ceaseless short-term memory loss. Absence of filter and judgment. Absence of balance at time. Repeating himself, asking the same damn questions. I was out of my mind, in denial, thinking that Greg was just becoming more the perfect asshole. Greg has always sought perfection. So the warden kind of got back at me. <laughs> Quote, in time, the evidence was overwhelming, particularly after Greg's parents had died, and he was no longer consumed with caring for him. He was privately consumed with fighting his own demons. Mary Catherine writes, British novelist E.M. Foster once wrote, you must be willing to let go of the life we have, that we have planned so as to live the life waiting for us. Now I must, she said. I read a lot of Christian author C.S. Lewis, who also speaks to my heart. Quote, it's not the load you carry that breaks you, Lewis writes. It's the way you carry the load, writes Mary Catherine. First, I needed to learn how to carry the load. Then I needed to learn that I was being carried. As I often lay awake at night when sleep is robbed, I reflect back on the serene, innocent days, and then I get up to fight another day with Greg. You know, in the last year, I've lost six close friends to the demon Alzheimer's. Now multiply that number around the world. Lots of spouses without mates, children without parents, grandchildren with fewer one loved ones to hold. Two of my friends who died, Steve Johansson and Ken Sullivan. My good friend Steve Johansson wrote articulately from the heart after his diagnosis and ongoing progressions, again dispelling the stereotype. Quote, I don't think I'll be at this desk much longer trying now to build a positive vision for the future. I've always been able to put pieces together to build beautiful, safe places for my family and friends. I suspect my tools will now lay unused and layered with ever deepening layers of dust. But on the positive note, I know my loved ones will pull me up and dust me off and take me out for fresh air, nature's beauty and the hugs that we all need sometime in the future. Ken Sullivan used to have beers with a good friend, Paul Boyce, after Ken's diagnosis and his ongoing progressions. They talked about Alzheimer's, how unfair it was, and like the final scene in the movie, Charlie adapted from Flowers from Algernon, they talked about the day when Ken would not recognize Paul. You won't see it coming, Paul told him, but I will. I know, replied Ken. I'll just be along for the ride. All of us in the room are along for the ride. We can learn from Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw, who prophetically said, quote, life is no brief candle. It's sort of a splendid torch, which I got to hold for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible.
before handing it to future generations. So burn your candles brightly. Perhaps Ernest Hemingway said, said it best when he observed, the world breaks everyone, and afterwards, some are strong in the broken places. Be strong in the broken places. It's all about the kids. God bless you. What do I do now? I think we have a little time, and I know that um, Connor and Mary Catherine are mic'd, and Greg is here for some questions. Uh, are there microphones also out in the? Okay, I see lots of hands, but it's bright up here. Yeah, just sit up there. Thank you so much for um, giving words to the experience. I always wanted my mother to tell me what was going on, and she couldn't. So I feel like you've said some things that um, just giving voice to what's going on, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I mean, what what we need to do is to give voice to this, and. Um, I, I was blessed, so to speak, because of those head injuries. I got a diagnosis 10 years before I probably would have. And like others, I would have experienced these symptoms and been afraid to talk about it. But I wasn't able to, as an investigative reporter, you have to multitask. I wasn't able to do that, so I sought help. So um, as a journalist, shame on me if I don't pass pass along what it's like from inside the mind of Alzheimer's. Uh, I'm no hero. I'm just trying to, I, 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 want a, I want a God who's like Coach Bill Belichick of the Patriots, and I know a lot of you guys don't like the Patriots, but <laughs> it's all right. Just, and I was a consultant for the Patriots too, but just do your job. So as a journalist, I'm just trying to do my job. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I wanted to ask a question about- This is about a press conference. You get a follow-up <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, as serving as a geriatric care manager, um, I would say the majority of my clients have some form of dementia, often Alzheimer's. And what I keep running into is the sense of shame and how the family closes down and it's very hard to even um, make headway like what you're talking about with them. There's a sense of shame and just closing down and not knowing what to do. So. You've probably answered the question already, but I think I keep running up against that wall of not knowing how to allow the family to see that it's, there is an opening. It just feels like it's closed. Well, you, you, I'm gonna ask Mary Catherine and Connor to comment, but you, um, you have to work at it, and, and I can sit here and make you laugh and read a speech, but there's the ugly side that I'm not gonna show you that these guys see. And I think you respond with another four letter word, L-O-V-E, from the heart. Um, but maybe Mary Catherine and Connor can just talk about how they deal with the explosions and the rage. Yeah, and what I think is it's, um, it's, it's pretty great because I think the three of us, first of all, is there a microphone? Yeah. Are we on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the three of us, um, have you know different relationships with my father? We deal with um, he's having a bad day. We deal with it in certain situations. You know, my brother, my old Brennan, he's uh, he's more like he, he'll lash out. Like you know, if my dad says something inappropriate, uh, should be a, a cookout, a dinner, anything, um, he'll lash out. But you know, I'll just kind of nudge him. And uh, just say, you know, you know, whisper like that. Don't say something like that. And so we kind of, kind of, we meet in the middle, I guess. So, um, and Colleen, um, I gotta say, uh, I think Mom knows more about Colleen. I'm gonna hand it to you because you know more about Colleen than Dad and Brendan and I because you two. I feel like I mean, sometimes I feel like uh, our family is. Totally separated because <laughs> you two, you two are in your own uh, little world. So, so you, uh, 
explain how calling deals Well, that's not, I was going to speak to the embarrassment about the disease. I, um, when I, is it on? Okay. I was going to speak to that. Um, when he first got diagnosis, we, we had had the experience with his mother, but still, I knew very little about Alzheimer's. And he became very forthright about it, and I was still very embarrassed. I didn't want anyone to know. And he kept giving in to these um, events, and one in particular was a local news show that comes, in, comes on after our news. It's called Chronicle. And he agreed to this Chronicle piece, and I was horrified. But they did a lovely job, and I hadn't told anybody, and I didn't want to tell anybody. <laughs> anyway, um, I always get so emotional to these things, but. Um, it was fantastic, by the way. It was, it was, anyway, so no one at school knew, knew about it. Um, very few of my friends, but I thought, oh gosh, not, you know, nobody's watching Chronicle. <laughs> so I walked into school the next day and hugs and flowers and, you know, why didn't you tell us? And my point is, once I finally was able to admit it and start sharing, as Greg forced me into it, <laughs> um, oh, it's what a difference. What a difference in the people we've met, the people, I have new lifelong friends that I never would have had if we hadn't been so open about this. And um, I encourage, I, I don't know how you get people to finally admit it. I also just read a, um, something about, that we're not identifying people who are dying of Alzheimer's because people won't admit they're dying of pneumonia or something else. And they said, if you read the obituaries, if we had the numbers right, more people are dying of Alzheimer's, but people aren't willing to admit that their loved one died of Alzheimer's. They will say it, it was pneumonia, it was this, that, that. Anyway, it's just that acknowledgement we need. So. Warden's pretty smart, huh? <laughs> Any other questions? I'm going to let them answer, but um, I'd start out just to the world. Don't treat us like lepers. We're not stupid. We just have a disease, you know. And, and um, you know, people think that if, if you have the disease, you know, you, you're, you're going you're gonna to look like the hunchback in Notre Dame, and, um, and, and you're not going to be able to speak. And... Maybe when you're 80, that happens, but when you're younger, it doesn't. And so many people do what I call the drive-by. Oh, you look so good. And it really pisses me off. And <laughs> what I've begun to say is, let me just tell you right now, I'm going to look better in a coffin than you look today. <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of shuts them up. But you guys. <clears throat> um. So, if, so, so, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you said if I, we had a magic wand? Yeah, um, a magic wand to get what you really need versus what you get. Well, first of all, I, I hope, you know, I never see my dad in a coffin because that would be awful. But um, a magic wand, I mean, that, that's a loaded question because I could, I could come up with just, like, a, a limitless, you go first. Because <laughs> um, so I'm going to say something inappropriate. Okay. And then, uh, our, ma our magic wand, again, has been all of you people, all the support. We have so many different organizations that we've gotten involved with. And that's, so many times people get the diagnosis that they don't know where to go. 
and they have to research. We have a local group that is phenomenal, but we also have the national groups. Um, and, and being in Boston, too, we have uh, so many different groups. But that's been my support right now um, because we're not at the stage where, he, you know, the stage that most of you are dealing with um, your, your clients. But um, I, I just, I so encourage people to get in touch with these organizations. They are phenomenal. I got to say, it's a blessing. It, it really is a blessing in disguise because, um, look, my dad, <laughs> how many speeches have you done over the past, you know, uh, five, six, I mean, a lot. But, um, a lot of ups and downs, but it is, <laughs> remember uh, the, the woman you worked with, with uh, she gave me that diary. Uh, oh, right. Um, it's sweetest woman on the planet. And she, uh, this is right after my dad got diagnosed. And uh, she was like, look, Connor, you know, I know you're traveling with your dad a lot. Just, just you know, jot down notes and things like that. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet. Like, you know, thank you so much. But in the back of my head, like, I'm, I'm not a diary type guy. <laughs> I have like 60 pages of just either, it, it would be like, it, it would jump from like, um, oh, uh, somebody came up and uh, shared her story and it was very uplifting. Uh, Dad, uh, we're on the plane and he farted and blamed it on somebody else. And then it's like, it just like goes, so there's like 60 goddamn pages of that. And I don't know whether to burn it or just like give it to, where's Steve? <laughs> We're Steve at. Doesn't matter. But um, it, th th there, there are so many memories that you know we're all gonna. My mother and I are never gonna forget. Um, I have the worst memories um, because it really. I mean, as far as like you know, travel, airports, and things like that. Um, I have so many things that I, 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 I want to say, but I really just, I, I, I can't, because it, that, that would be. I'm from, I'm from Maine, and Maine is one of the states that has approved medical marijuana. And I can't, you I mentioned can't, I, about I, is this the Blessed Virgin the speaking? I can't find you. What did he say? I didn't, <laughs> anyway. Mike, you mentioned about the confusion and the increased okay. stimulation that causes more confusion. My concern about medical marijuana, the, one of the, the, con the conditions that Maine approved it for was agitation in Alzheimer's. And my concern is that if people have a th an environment that's not very therapeutic and that makes them feel more confused. I'm not sure that giving them medical marijuana will help. I'm just wondering what, what you think about that. The only thing I could say is listen and study. Um, uh, I, I don't want to take a lot of substance that dumbs me down. I want to keep all of yeah, my research. Go ahead, yeah. Marijuana? Okay, so, yeah, so, go ahead. Uh, yeah, a few years, uh, more than that. We were in Malibu. What's the guy's name? Uh, Eldridge? The, no, no, no. We, we, we visited oh, that guy. Yeah, and, yeah. I and forgot. he yeah. gave you, uh, he gave my dad um, something that was worth at least 500 bucks. It, not, it was an edible, like marijuana. And uh, he's like, you know, you got to try this. And I was like, I don't smoke. Marijuana. Yeah, dad, go ahead. I don't really care. And he just threw it in the trash. That really upset me because, like, <laughs> I mean, if, if somebody just like hands you something that is apparently, you know, it's five, it's worth five hundred dollars. <laughs> Look, I, you just you can't. Then try it. I gotta, I gotta watch what I say here. <laughs> so I might just end it right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that, I, they want me to. Um, He's very stubborn, is what I'm. Trying to say in so many words, yeah. and it drives me nuts. Um, but I love him to death, and he's my hero, and, and uh, we die for him in a, in a split second. And um, carry on, Dad. I. Thank you. I I I just want to end with uh, an anecdote about my mother. These people, of my son and Mary Catherine, have heard it a million times, but. It, it, it resonates. Uh, 
this is the hero of my life. And um, again, she taught me to speak and write from the heart. And I would urge all of you in, in wherever you are in whatever situation to write and speak from the heart. Um, I was at her deathbed. She was in the nursing home and the nurses said, your mother's very upset. You need to come by. And um, so I was just two miles away and I was like, 9 30 10 o'clock and I went in and she's asleep and I woke her up very she had 10 kids and five miscarriages but she was like five foot four 106 pounds and and um, I woke her up and I said mom I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to wake you up the nurses said that you were scared and she said no Greg I'm glad you're here that was the first time in about eight months she could use my name and there was a continence to her. I don't know if any of you in, in your profession, I'm sure you have, you're around someone who is about to die and they have this continence, almost this glow. And um, I put my chair next to her bed, she was lying down, I put my hand on her hand and her hand was shaking and put it on top of mine and, and we talked. Not big things, but we talked. She was talking through her heart um, which pushes back on a lot of medical things because I'm just going to ask you, is memory in the brain all that's cracked up to be? I believe it's the heart. And I waited till she fell asleep. I got up, I kissed her on the forehead. Her eyes opened immediately and she said this clearly. She said, Greg, where are you going? And I realized the moment was at hand. I sat down, I said, Mom, I'm not going anywhere. We're riding this one out together. I held her hand until she fell asleep. I kissed her on the forehead. She never woke up again. Fast forward uh, to a speech I was asked to give for the Alzheimer's Association in Hollywood. It was called A Night at Sardi's, and uh, Hollywood's finest was there, all uh, award-winning uh, uh, you know, actors and, and, and producers and, and from every, every aspect. Uh, and I was asked to give the keynote Alzheimer's speech. So I had prepared my speech, but I was standing um, behind stage and I got really nervous. And, um, and so I looked up at heaven and I said, Mom, this is for you. I heard in the place of my heart, this is just what I heard. I heard, Greg, you rock this. You just rock it. And I went out and I rocked it. And, I, and I, as I was giving my speech, reading from it, which was so cool, there was, there was a woman standing behind me. She was so encouraging, so loving. I just felt comfortable in that space. And I wanted to turn around and see who it was. And um, I, my, my mind kept saying, my heart kept saying, stay focused, stay focused. So at the end of the speech, sometimes where you want to thank everyone, um, a thousand Hollywood people stood up in, 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 in an ovation. And uh, David Hyde Pierce, who's Frazier and, and Tony Award winner, he was the MC, and he stuck his face in the microphone and said, that's what we're talking about, and stepped away. And, and, and I was crying, and, and I think people in the audience feeling the same way. And I turned around because I wanted to thank that woman. And she, you know, she, had, she, she wasn't there, she's gone. So I went back to the table tables like this, and um, circular, 10 at a table, and uh, I turned to my wife and I said, who was the woman behind me? She was, she was so encouraging, she was so loving, she made me feel so special, who was it? And she said, what? I said, who was the woman behind me? She was so encouraging, she was so loving, she made me feel so special. Greg, there was no woman. I went around the table, talking to 10 people, and they said, there was no woman. I believe the spirit of my mother was on stage that night, and the spirit of, of, of many others who have died from Alzheimer's, so, and they were speaking from their heart, and I heard it and I saw it. Speak from your heart, God bless you.